culture, always establish some social ranking, rankings between those who cultivate it, enrich it, and advance it, and those who avoided, disdain, or ignored it, who were excluded from culture for social and economic reasons. Up until our time, there were cultured and uncultured people. And between those two extremes, people who were more or less cultured or more or less uncultured. This classification was quite clear for the whole world because the same system of values, cultural criteria, and ways of thinking, judging, and behaving applied to everyone. Nowadays, everything has changed. The notion of culture has expanded so much that it has simply vanished, although no one dares to openly acknowledge it. We wanted to do away with the elites who morally disgusted us with their privilege, disparaging and discriminatory sarcasm, whose very name clashed with our egalitarian ideas. Over time, from the different trenches, we were refuting and eliminating that exclusive corps of pedants who believed they were superior, who bragged about how they had monopolized knowledge, moral values, spiritual elegance, and good taste. But what we obtain is a pyrrhic victory, a cure worse than the disease living in confusion in a world in which, paradoxically, everything and nothing is culture, since there is no way to know exactly what culture is. In the most cultivated circumstances and societies in history, culture consisted of hierarchies in the broad ra range of insights that form knowledge. On an all-encompassing morality requiring freedom an enabling expression of the great diversity of humanity, but firm in its rejection of all that vilifies and degrades the basic notion of humanity and threatens survival of the species. It was an elite comprised not by reason or birth or economic or political power, but by the effort, talent, and work completed and with the moral authority to establish in a flexible, renewable way an order of importance of values in the arts, science, and technology. It must return to this if we are to avoid moving blindly without direction like robots to our, our disintegration. Culture can be experiment and reflection, thought and dream, passion and poetry, and a constant, profound, and critical review of all certitudes, convictions, theories, and beliefs. But it cannot be separated from real life, true life, life lived, which is never that of platitudes, of artifice, sophism, and frivolity, without the risk of disintegrating it. It may seem pessimistic, but it is my impression that with an irresponsibility as large as our irrepressible vocation for games and entertainment, we have, made, we have made culture one of those showy but fragile castles in the sun which falls apart at the first gust of wind. Thank you very much. Where will this elite come from? Well, the elite. Uh, you know, why is well, it that the democracy needs I, an elite? I don't think. Well, you, it is it's not only democracy; it's, it's also culture. It's particularly culture what needs elites. Uh, what we should uh, try to fight against is the idea that the elite is a kind of privilege of rich people or influential people. This is, of course, intolerable.
Absolutely, we, are, we should be against this kind of elites. But I am thinking in an elite that is born out of the vocation, effort, and talent of people. Mm -hmm. A society like a real democratic society in which opportunities are open to everybody. Some have this vocation. Some have the vocation of philosophy, history, humanities, as others have the vocation of scientific knowledge, technology. Uh, well, the cultural elite should be born out of these three exclusive uh, reasons. Vocation, if you have the vocation, hard work, and talent. Not everybody has the same kind of talent. Not everybody has the same vocation. Not everybody is able to invest effort in the same way. Well, the uh, ideal democratic culture elite is an elite born out of talent, effort, and vocation. This will not disappear. The idea that elite, by essence, is undemocratic is completely absurd. You mentioned that the biggest crisis we are facing is the crisis of education. Yes. The question is, how is it possible that the richest part of the world, which is the West, is suffering from this crisis of education? Because I think the society has advanced uh, too much, uh, and the, the educational system uh, has not been uh, advancing at the same pace. And I think there is a, a kind of uh, abyss between uh, the problems that modern societies face and the kind of educational system that we, that we have. We are not preparing through our educational system the kind of uh, uh, professionals and, uh, and technicians and, and uh, scientists uh, and uh, humanists uh, that the kind of society that we have our day needs. And this is something that has... Uh, I think what happened in... I, I mentioned May 68 because it's very interesting. I think in May 68, this feeling of distance in the, into the educational institutions and the social uh, reality of our days was perceived and, but the problem is that the kind of solution that was fine was absolutely counterproductive. Destruction of authority, uh, the idea that uh, education was something that deeply uh, was impregnated with the idea of repression. Uh, the idea of Foucault was so largely, you know, shared. Uh, and if not shared in a way that was the air of the rebellion of the youth people was contaminated with these ideas. So the destruction of authority, instead of solve the problem of education, aggravated it. Aggravated it. Uh, and un until now, we don't have models to follow, so we have to create the new, the new models. It is said that uh, um, maybe in very remote kind of places, there are now schools and, and, and universities that have found it. But what is a, par a paradox is that the most advanced uh, and modern countries of the world have a, a crisis on, a, a such crisis in education and don't find the way to reconstruct the educational system. No? It's one of the challenges that we have, that our democracies have in, in our days. But there is, there is probably an even more powerful uh, uh, reason uh, uh, next to the betrayal of the intellectuals and the ongoing betrayal of the intellectuals, and that is uh, uh, um, explained so beautifully uh, and intelligently by Dostoevsky in his legend of the Quent Inquisitor, that your whole notion of uh, uh, a culture and looking into the abyss, etc., 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 or the wish for freedom, 
um, is overruled by the fact that people want to be happy. And that happiness and the, the pursuit of happiness, that's the main call. And for happiness, science, technology, commercial world images are much more helpful than the difficulties of your concept of culture. But what do you understand by happiness? Because I think the, problem, the key of the problem is there. Uh, well, happiness if, if is, happiness is to be in total agreement with the, with the world in which you live as it is, this is one definition of happiness. So probably the most happy people in the world are the idiot people, you know? <laughs> people without imagination, without critical spirit, people that are totally conform with the kind of life that they have. If this is happiness, the idiots are very happy people, you know? And uh, I don't want to be happy in this way. I prefer to be very unhappy, but uh, enjoying this possibility of criticize the world that is around me. Uh, I, I prefer to be unhappy thinking and imagining a better kind of world for me and for everybody and for my, my, my sons and my family and my, my friends. Uh, I don't think literature makes people more happy. No, well, it produces a great pleasure when you read a great book. But after, when you have finished the book, the effects are, you are more prepared to be unhappy because of the good literature that you have read.